University with Texas A&M Agroactive Research. Um, we have a lot of master gardeners in here that we have a great relationship with. We're excited to have them here. Um, but this is a, a beginning of a relationship for Ellis County to offer education. Um, and the classes are all free to you, except for this class if you want to be able to. The education part of it is free. And that's one of the things we focus on within Water University. Uh, we are a team that has three horticulturalists on staff, including myself. Um, so whether it's rainwater harvesting or lawn care maintenance, if you want to learn about drip irrigation, uh, whatever it is that you want to learn about, edibles, uh, vegetable gardening, things of that nature, we have a course for you. They're not always going to be located here. We teach all over the state, but we focus our highest concentration is in North Texas. So we're all over the place. And if you go to our website, which is on the back of the publication that I gave you, it's wateruniversity.tamu.edu. That's where most of y'all prepaid for your barrels tonight. That lists all of our classes. We update it on a regular basis. And trust me, classes are added daily. My schedule's getting a little tight for this year. Um, but we're all over the place, and we're happy to do this. Uh, my other colleagues, uh, Daniel and Dottie, um, are also teaching classes uh, all over the Metroplex tonight. They're in different locations. The website's got some great data and information for you, including, like you see, the courses, a plant search database, which we're about to add over 250 plants to. We're just kind of getting all of our pictures together. And what it does is you go on there and you can put criteria in there of a plant you're looking to put in your landscape. All the plants we focus on are strictly native and adapted plants. We don't put any high water use, high fertilizer use plants on our list, and you will find no floral hydrangeas, azaleas, things like that on our list. All of them are going to be plants that we want you to be successful with. The reason we're very limited on the plants we put on there is we're only going to put plants that are available to you. We're not going to realistically put something on the list that you couldn't find at different times of the year. Uh, you Landscape it is a design software that I'm putting together. Uh, it'll have about 25 plant uh, designs by the end of the month. Um, and it's designed you can use and borrow in your own landscape, as well as all of our publications. We now have about 13 publications. One of them is in your hand. And you can't physically get this publication unless you take the Rain Barrel class, because we want you to have the education, the why and the how. That's very important to this process. Another thing that we have that uh, if you come to any of our other courses or you visit any of your Master Gardener events is the deck of cards. It's our top 100 most recommended plants from North Texas, and it's a deck of plant tags, if you will. So it's not like playing cards, it's a deck of plant tags. It helps you design, it helps you shop, um, and it gives you information about pollinators, how big a plant is, all the stuff you'll see on a plant tag as well. And then another thing we're excited, how many of y'all go up to the Dallas area at all? Okay. You might know where our campus is at. A lot of people, when we say Texas A&M, they think I came from College Station. All right? I wouldn't willingly be coming. But, uh, but we didn't drive off. We came from, I came from Dallas. All right? We have a Dallas research campus. It's located on Coit, just south of the George Bush Turnpike, kind of where Richardson, Plano, and Dallas all come together. We are building a whole new facility. This is the uh, first state-of-the-art facility in 75 years in afterlife history. We're very excited about it, and it actually is beginning to look like this now. <laughs> um, it's been a war zone right now, mud everywhere. I got mud all over my pants and shoes just from walking in the office today. Uh, at Water University, we will also have our own satellite building, where we'll be able to teach things like rain barrel classes um, as well. We're really excited about it because it's all windows. And with the flip of a button, I can tend the windows to do a presentation. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and then we'll have about a 34,000 square foot demonstration garden uh, that my colleagues and I are designing that will also go with. Uh, so the actual grand opening of this building will probably be about March next year. So we still have about another year of what we call a war zone before it's all done. Uh, but if you uh, ever want to come to a class on our campus once it's open, come to at least see the campus. We have demonstration homes that show you the water sense labeled products how to be efficient in your home inside and out, about 40 to 50 percent more efficient than the average home. We demonstrate things like rain more harvesting. In fact, if you go to this right here, we're going to have equivalent of 80,000 gallons of harvesting on our new building. Wow. It will operate the entire irrigation system for the demonstration garden. Off, yeah, off of the Water University building, we're going to have 30,000 gallons to operate that landscape and also flush the toilets. All right, because there are new laws that allow you to plumb rainwater into your home. Now the cities can uh, put in ordinances, building ordinances, to help mandate how that is done safely. It has to be treated, all right? Either by UV light filtration, micron filtration, or things of that nature. 
uh, but it can now be plumbed on the inside of the home. So you heard me talk about uh, that we need to do this class for the why and the how, right? Well, we're going to get to the how, how to build your barrel and set up your barrel. But first, we need to talk about the why. You know, when we travel, sometimes the country, talking in conferences, professional conferences, a lot of people say, well, rain barrels don't do anything. Why do you do rain barrels? Rain barrels are one of the biggest teaching tools that we have. And the reason for it is, here, yeah, it's a 55-gallon barrel. That water is not going to go very far. But what it does, it allows, it teaches you the new, put a new value on water, a value that you didn't have before. It will force you to start being more efficient with that valuable rainwater that you want to use on your plants. Now, the flip side of that is it's also going to cause an addiction. <laughs> and what I mean by that is we have some people that come to every single one of these classes and they'll have like 11 or 40 barrels. We have another class if you get that far into the addiction, and we'll talk about that. So let's talk about the why. And the why has a lot to do with our water supply and a lot to do with our drought. You may have remembered 2014. It was the end of one of our largest droughts, right? We looked like this going into the summertime. That was May. Water restrictions were here. People were going, how in the world are we going to do this? But the thing people were most worried about was, how are they going to water their plants? And I'm going, as a horticulturist, I'm going, well, what about bathing and eating? Are you concerned about that? All right, as a horticulturist, I will tell you that the number one problem in the landscape is open water. People don't actually know how, they, how much they need the water. Well, in 2014, we got a little bit of rain there in the summertime, and we ended our summer better than we started it. So we all got to take a deep breath, right? And then what happened in 2015? The floods occurred, and we went to zero residents in the state of Texas under a drought. Zero residents. Well, between mid-July to mid-October, the rain stopped. And what happened? Right back into a drought. That quickly, it happened that quickly. And then in mid-October, what happened again? That's where most parts of the Texas got. Some places, 70 to 80 inches of rainfall. That one week we had that we got 18 inches of rain. Last week, my house had after 10 inches until like 2015 all over here. So our Thanksgiving, we looked pretty good. That's how quickly things change. So if we look at our current drought map. Yes, we're in a drought with all this rain. Now, we're doing pretty well compared to the rest of the state. But if we look like this already going into the summertime, you see our concern. Do you know how we measure drought? There's all these coefficients that go into play. Rainfall, population, things. But the biggest factor that we take into consideration is this little thing called soil moisture. We look at how much we're absorbing and holding in our soil. Because without soil moisture, what's affected? Plants, foundations, roads, water supply, and when our, 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 our ground gets really dry and we do get rain, what happens? It's runs right off. Now, we were fortunate that we got a little bit of rain before this rain occurred, and then we got a lot of rain. So our soil is fully saturated in most areas of Texas right now. But how quickly is that going to change? Our water supply. Most of our water in North Texas, if you notice this concentration of all these reservoirs, you call them lakes. You go skiing, skiing on them, you boat on them. But you know why those were built? That's our water supply. Going to South Texas, they rely a lot heavier on aquifers. We rely on surface water, which is lakes. Did you know every single lake in the state of Texas, with the exception of one, is man-made? Cattle Lake. We share with Louisiana. It's a natural wildlife refuge, so we can only pull so much water from that. Every other lake in the state we created for our water supply. So where did we get our water before we built all these reservoirs? Wells. Wells. Aquifers, right? That's what we've got. So now we've kind of flipped our cycle. We're in the process of diverting our water to fill up our reservoirs instead of absorbing our water. As of right now in the state of Texas, we only sit at 85.8% capacity. And who do you think holds most of that? Do you think our lakes are at 100%? No, no. Most of them are sitting in about 83, 84% capacity. 
But when we look at 2011, that was later on one of our lakes that was most affected by the drought in North Texas. And this was it in 2015 when people downstream like Houston are screaming at us going, please quit spilling water out of your spills. <laughs> because they are downstream from us. They receive all the dirty water. They get the kind of what we call the first flush of water goes to them. And then the last overflow flush. But that's geography. We can't really help that. That's the topography of it. And then when we take that factor in, also population. How many of y'all are in Waxahachie? Oh, well, okay. Well, when we look at Waxahachie, when I look at Dallas, that's where I'm from. All right, Shirley and I were actually talking about this. My neighborhood is the one being evacuated because of the gas right now. <laughs> but um, this, uh, when we look at population, look at Waxahachie, look at Waxahachie five years ago. Look how it's exploded. Look how they're having to renovate and build more highways or widen highways around you. All right? Concrete's growing all around us. These are just estimates. And these are 2016 estimates. Because they come from the EPA, but the Texas Water Development Board put out new estimates. They say we sit at about 29 million people right now. That's estimated to grow to 51 to 54 million people. But then look at the next line. Our water supply is expected to drop 3 million acre feet. So that surface water, those reservoirs, we're going to have less water, double the people. Why do you think that is? Any guesses? It has actually nothing to do with use. <coughs> and everything to do with this little thing called sedimentation. The floors of our lakes are slowly rising. They're holding less water. It's a natural process that happens all over the world. We just speed it up at a very rapid rate because of that little thing called what? Runoff. Run Everything that goes into those storm drains ends up into these lakes. That's what it is. But here's the kicker. With this amount of water and this amount of people, we have enough water. But you know what? We're not very efficient with it. We have cities that can account for what's called GPCD, gallons per use per day per person. 300, 350 gallons a day. That's a lot of water. Right? That's why we need to reduce it. And that's where some things like rainwater harvesting come in. But when we look at that drought, when we look at that runoff, before we had all of these um, you know, great cities, things like that, we used to absorb about half of our rainfall into the ground, only diverting 10 to 15 percent into tributaries, which typically went into aquifers. We quickly changed that to go into lakes. Well, Payne Paradise put up a parking lot. We now divert over half of our water to fill up those lakes, and we're only absorbing 10 to 15 percent. So if we're only absorbing 10 to 15 percent versus 50 percent we were doing before, do you now understand why we are getting drier and hotter faster? Why droughts are occurring more often? <coughs> so it's not a matter of if, it's when we go back into a drought. And we have to look at that quality of water, that sedimentation I was talking about, that runoff. <laughs> This is pure sedimentation. How many times have y'all been by a construction site and seen that silt fence falling over? I was in construction for years. I know. But that sandbags are not going to stop that from occurring. That's pure sedimentation going in there. Me coming to see you today, those dark stripes down the middle of my lane, what do you think that is? Oil, wear and tear from tires, trash. Our modern highway systems are specifically designed to drain into those storm drains and out into those lakes to help prevent what? Flooding. That's why our older highways are flooding, because they weren't designed as well, like Loop 12 up in Dallas. We as homeowners are actually the biggest violators when it comes to this. And what I mean by that is we are marketed very well. We're marketed very well as to what garden soils buy, what fertilizers buy, right? What plants? You walk into those nurseries, all oh, those plants are beautiful, but are they the right plant? We're marketed really well. All those chemicals from ant control, pest and in, uh, weed control, things of that nature. People don't actually know what they need. I was in a nursery a couple of years ago, and I go in there to kind of see what's occurring, because I educate the public, right? And I was watching this associate 
explaining to these people, oh yeah, you got grubs, just treat for grubs. The next person walked up, oh you got grubs, treat for grubs. The next person walked up, they had a picture on their phone. And said, this is what my yard looks like. He just kind of glanced at it, oh you've got grubs. Hmm. So I went up to that person and I asked, I, first of all, I introduced who I was, and I asked if I could see the picture on their phone. I looked at their picture, you know what they had? They had what's called a brown patch. It's a fungus. Not an insect. So that insecticide that they're putting on their lawn that's not being triggered or used, what do you think is happening to that? Running off. Running off the storm drains out on the lakes. How many people have dogs here? How many people pick up after their dogs? 40% of Americans do not. Our natural ecosystem handles the waste of two domestic dogs per square mile. We average 125 dogs per square mile in the urban environment. Their waste harbors more harmful pathogens for us than it does them. Things like salmonella, E. coli, everything you try to keep out of your kitchen, if you're leaving their waste down on the ground, it's in your soil. It's leaching off. We can find pet waste from domestic animals in our water supply. Not wildlife, domestic animals. We find chemicals like atrazine, which is found in a lot of weed feed products in our water. Atrazine is a, uh, toxic to aquatic life. And we cannot remove it safely from the well, we have to we can remove it safely from water, but it takes a lot. How many of y'all ever been to a water treatment plant and walked and toured it? Every once in a while I get a couple of people that say they have. I'm one of those people that I feel like if you sign up for a water bill, you should be required to go take a tour of the water treatment plant. So you can see the infrastructure, the manpower, and the energy that goes into making our water safe for us to drink. Please don't get on the bandwagon of the raw water that you see all over the news. All right? Because there are contaminants that are harmful for us in there. But where can we make a difference in the landscape? Well, this is where we make a difference. It's estimated nationally that 30 to 70 percent of our residential water during the months of June, July, August, and September goes to the outdoors. Which end of the spectrum do you think more Texas is on? Maybe we've kind of helped to push the average up? We forget what irrigation systems, sprinklers at the end of hoses, you holding a water hose with a spigot, were designed to do. They were designed to supplement the lack of rainfall. When we don't get rain, we supplement water to keep our landscapes alive or keep them up to the commercial quality picture, right, that we see on TV. We forget this, and it's because we are spoiled. I have a lot of people say, well, what do you mean? Okay, well, how many of y'all remember having to get up and changing the channel on the TV instead of with the remote? <laughs> how many of y'all remember not having a cell phone and having to get up and go answer it off the wall? That's what I mean by we're spoiled by. That automatic sprinkler is special. Going off at 12, 5 o'clock in the morning, we don't know if there's a problem, if it's overwatering, if it's spraying concrete. This is where we have gotten ourselves in trouble. But it's also where we can make a difference by doing things like rainwater harvesting. All right? Rainwater harvesting is simple. This is where I'm going to remove the intimidation factor. We do this with irrigation. We want to remove that intimidation factor for you. And what I mean by that is, rainfall is this simple. Rainwater harvesting. You're capturing the rain on your roof. You're diverting it through gutters, or if you don't have gutters, the valley of the roof. Through a pipe, or just allowing the water to pour onto the cistern and storing it for future use. Your barrel is a cistern. We call them rain barrels, but it's technically a cistern. This is a larger scale, a thousand gallon cistern, okay? What it does is it actually reduces the demand on the municipal water supply, meaning we're not pulling too much of that water that we want to use for drinking water, bathing, and cooking, all right? So this does help, and this is the teaching tool. You see how quickly the water goes away, but you also see how quickly it fills up. We'll talk about all of you here shortly. Makes efficient use of the valuable resource, or the most valuable water. What's the best water for plants? Rainwater. Rainwater. How many of y'all have an automatic sprinkler system? Okay. When your automatic sprinkler system goes off and it waters the landscape, yeah, the plants get a little bit of water. But did you notice the difference between after it runs versus after it rains? You see how vibrant your landscape looks after it rains, like fresh and clean and vibrant versus city water? There's a big difference, isn't there? That's what I mean by that. It helps with flooding, erosion, 
and contamination of surface water from runoff. Some people have those downspouts that wash everything out, or the valley of their roof where the water hits the ground and washes everything out. This is that runoff, all those chemicals, that sedimentation running off. Rainwater harvesting helps slow the water down to mitigate those types of problems. That's what benefits with stormwater. And rainwater saves you money because it's what? Free. 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 You like my cloud? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody in the state of Texas can tax you or charge you for the use of rainwater harvesting. Yes, ma'am. In uh, states like Colorado, you can I, they do now. They were the last state to come on board. When was that? It was uh, last year. I don't remember exactly what month it was. Because I was up there last year and I was talking about this yeah. class actually. And they said, well, we can't do that in Colorado. They have opened it up. The reason they, they've opened it up is just two barrels to res each resident. And they're doing their research based on, they, you have to remember in Colorado and other states like that, their natural water cycle is what they maintain. We've kind of messed ours up. We flipped ours up. They're trying to maintain, they want to make sure that if people do rainwater harvesting, they're not pulling from a natural watershed. They're going to find that it doesn't, because that's what our research shows. They were the last one to come on board, so not every state in the union allows it. Okay. At different, or at different levels. And fortunately, Texas has some of the most progressive of the laws. In the state of Texas, if you are harvesting 500 gallons or less of gray water, AC condensate, or rainwater harvesting, Nobody can require you to obtain permission or a permit to install. Cities have the option of 500 gallons or higher to request that you get a permit for inspection. It's typically free. They just want to make sure you're installing it safely. Larger cisterns like that, the setup is different than what we're talking about today. That's how simple it is. But nobody in the state of Texas can tell you no. And we'll get into that a little bit at the end. Now, here's the thing. When we talk about rainwater harvesting, people think it's something new. Yeah. It's not. It's something we kind of got away from, but it's nothing new. Other parts of the world have never stopped doing it. We got away from it. This is a, the basement of a sixth century castle. That is a sister. You see the water? Hmm. They're still harvesting rainwater today. I've been there. She's been there. They're Istanbul. still harvesting rainwater today. Is it Istanbul? Istanbul. Yep. I have, another, I have a better picture of something even better in Istanbul, too. But they're still harvesting the rainwater, with the exception of some modern plumbing, which we can appreciate, right? Sewage and things like that. The Romans did it thousands of years ago. It was underneath their road systems. You can see here these bricks would have been across the road, and this is the cistern underneath. You can still go down and tour the cisterns today. They're still harvesting. They're still overflowing properly. The Mayans also did it. They created cave systems and harvested the rainwater for bathing and things of that nature. Obviously, the stairs are new, but you get the idea. This is an Istanbul. There is a labyrinth of cisterns underneath the city. You can go take tours in it. And uh, recently, somebody just came back in the International Horticultural Congress is there this year. And unfortunately, I can't. I went and was in Australia and New Zealand, and we got to see a lot of rainwater harvesting. But somebody has informed me that they now have an opera house down in the cisterns because of the acoustics. Hmm. They're building restaurants and stores down in the cisterns to make it a whole other level. And then more modern systems are things like this. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in downtown Seattle. That is not a parking garage. You see the shiny walls. That is a one million gallon system. A million gallons in Seattle. What's the one thing Seattle is known for? <laughs> and they're harvesting a million gallons. <clears throat> Who here has seen a million gallons being harvested in Texas? <laughs> think maybe we're kind of behind on the game a little bit? And we have more progressive rainwater laws than they do. And they have a million gallons. Is that the they it? <clears throat> is that yes. It all, yeah, they took the picture before that. You oh. can't. You can go down there. The repairman can go down there, but it's full. Oh. They use it for all their landscaping irrigation and green roof irrigation, as well as flushing toilets. Oh. And then my colleague Daniel had the pleasure of traveling to Africa, teaching people where they average three inches of rainfall a year, harvesting rainwater and growing crops that generations before never had the pleasure of eating. Rainwater harvesting is basic curriculum. 
in other parts of the world. Who here knows that there's their kids, grandkids, nephews, nieces learning about rainwater harvesting in their school? The only ones I know are the ones that we've introduced. That's sad. Because rainwater harvesting has so many benefits. The quality of the water. You know that white, crusty stuff you get on your shower heads and your faucets or on the bottom of your pots? That's calcium and lime. We don't get that with rainwater harvesting. Our rainwater harvesting is slightly acidic. Our rainwater is about 6.5. Our soil is about 8.5. It benefits our soil. Who here grows tomatoes? You have to irrigate with rainwater. Because rainwaters are what? Or tomatoes are what? Acidic. acidic. Rainwater slightly acidic. Does that make sense? You see how this goes together? Um, and then it has, it doesn't have all the chemicals like chlorine, fluorine, all the stuff that save for us. Plants don't like it. And you have to remember the water is going to be as clean coming out as it goes in. So the basic filtration system that we're going to be talking about today with your barrel is kind of a pre-filter. You're still going to get some um, buildup at the bottom of your barrel. It's nothing to worry about as long as your water is coming out clear. If your water is coming out clear and it's not brown, and it's not yellow, then you're fine. That little buildup at the bottom of the bar barrel we call a biofilter, sludge. All right? It's just like at the bottom of a pond, a stream. It helps clean the water. It's got beneficial bacteria. You're not going to be drinking it. So, but it's good for your plant. So as long as the water is coming out clear, there's no reason to ever empty and wash out your barrel. I've been in my house now for three years. I have 1,500 gallons storage, 1,000 gallons, uh, five, uh, 450 gallons, and I have one, two barrels now, so 1550, two barrels, and not one of them has ever been cleaned out, and the water's clear. I have a barrel that's designated for my water feature in the front of my house. Yes, I have a water feature, but when that barrel runs dry, guess what? I have a dry feature. <laughs> and I have a barrel designated just for my indoor plants, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. And then my other two larger cisterns are for my landscape. So keep that in mind. It can be done. So you have to remember all the little critters running across your roof, leaving you gifts. If you're not cleaning off your roof, like who here has pecans and oak trees that bloom the catkins, that can turn your water yellow, almost too acidic. So you don't want to harvest the rainwater when this is occurring. What I do is I open up my barrels, allow the water to pass through. When it's done, I clean off my roof, close my barrels back up and get fresh water. All right, those blooms will make that water too acidic. Clean out your gutters and the valley of your roof. If you want to harvest rainwater, you have to clean those gutters and those valley of the roof off. I know there's a big push for green roofs, but that's not what we're talking about. Today. <laughs> Clean out your Yeah, well, I mean, like the buildup of dirt and stuff that gets in it from your neighbor. Oh, well, there's different ways. You know, I get on my roof and I just use a blower and a broom to clean out my gutters. I have the caging over now. But most companies that I've seen that go around cleaning gutters, they use power washers. But soap or whatever? No, just water. Okay. And again, you don't have to, if it's to this extreme, <laughs> I guarantee you one of two things. These gutters are going to be warped, and you're probably going to be all uh, Because it's just thin aluminum. The other thing people don't realize is, what, well, let's finish this really quick, but if, you got to clean this out. So we're not talking about drinking water today. All right? That's a totally separate issue, and it does require pre-filtering and sanitation like UV light. So if you're interested in indoor plumbing, number one, you have to make sure if you're in city limits, what ordinances did your cities adopt under the new codes in the state of Texas? Um, and there's a large plant class that we teach twice a year. We teach it in late spring and early fall. That has a different setup. But we're not talking about drinking water today. But a lot of people will sit there and say, okay, well, what about mosquitoes? Well, we know that with mosquitoes, we need to keep what under control? Moisture. Standing water. All right, they need like, I think it's like an eighth of an inch to reproduce them. And we'll cover that with the top of your arrow. But most people don't ever look at their gutters. When they say, I've got, got everything in my landscape outside to control mosquitoes, and I still have mosquitoes. Did you look at your gutters? Did you look to see if you had that little bit of water in your gutter? Most gutter systems over time sat. 
And that little sag that's not visible to our eye unless you inspect it will hold water in between rain events. You can look right now after yesterday's rain, and if you have standing water in your gutters, it's time to have your gutters serviced to make sure that the pitch of your gutters is maintained properly. Most people don't get on a ladder and look at that. Where to use your rainwater? Irrigation's the number one. Outdoors. Some people up in North Texas Municipal Water, uh, where they were on 2014, once every two week watering, they were looking at their foundations. They were harvesting rainwater. The cities were giving rebates on their rain barrels to get people to harvest rainwater to water their foundations. House plants. How many, how many of y'all are house plant addicts like myself? It's okay. I'm an addict. It's okay. You know, I'm not going to make you stand up and say your name. But how many of y'all see problems like this? You know what this is? Sometimes it's going to be a lack of humidity, right? Which means that your heater's going a lot harder than it should be. But this is sulfur. What did we talk about that had sulfur? City water, tap water. This, is the burnt tips, is typically a sign of chemicals like chlorine. Plants don't like it. Once they pumped it into their system, it can't go back out. They have to pump it to the furthest point. It concentrates at the tip of the leaf and burns it. If you start watering with rainwater, you don't have this problem. If you continue to have this problem, it's a sign of lack of humidity. When I watered uh, my house plants at work, mm -hmm. I just put a jug out and let the chlorine yep. dissipate over my but I still get the black tips. Because of the calcium and other things in there. Yeah. yeah, not all the chemicals we put in there, like chlorine, will go away. Yeah. Um, aquariums and terrariums. I have terrariums in my office that I only use rainwater in, I only use tap water. Bird baths. And I have a funny story with bird baths. So, this is the McKinney resident. She took the rainwater harvesting class. She was gung ho. She was so excited. She went out there and set up her barrel. She was, I couldn't finish. I was trying to get it done before the rain hit. And she was, I couldn't, I didn't have time. I didn't finish it. So she, the rainstorm passed. She went out there after the storm passed, and she goes, I couldn't get by the barrel. <laughs> she said, because of all these birds. They were using the top of the barrel as a bird bath. She didn't drain it like we had told her. She hadn't gotten to that step yet. And she said, I was just outside working on that flower bed. I cleaned out my bird bath and filled it back up. And she said, there wasn't one bird on my bird bath. <laughs> they were all on the barrel. I said, yeah, we did you fill the bird bath? City water. There's a difference. That's why some people will use even the rainwater for pet water bowls. We teach uh, farmers how to create what's called uh, uh, wildlife guzzlers. They create a little mini roof with a barrel trickling into a pan to water wildlife. Uh, wild uh, livestock, that's another thing we do the wildlife guzzlers for. Vol uh, firefighters, volunteer firefighters, a lot of times have to pay for their water. And on the West Coast, it's been a big issue. So you go look at fire stations and volunteer fire stations on the West Coast, they have huge cisterns on the outside of the fire station. They harvest rainwater for you to fight fires. And that was in demand this last year, too. So how much water are you going to get? Well, we have to determine what your footprint of your home is. All right? Not the pitch, the shape, the style of your roof. That makes no difference. Because on a regular rainstorm, and not a North Texas storm going from rainbow and sideways, which way does water fall? Usually. Yeah. So it doesn't matter the shape of your roof. There's this footprint over your home that we're looking at, right? So if you have a one-story house, it's basically the square footage of your home. If you have a two-story house, it's the square footage of your roof. So you have to do the math on that one, okay? But use that. I'm going to give you an example of it. If we took a 2,000-square-foot home, we multiply that 2,000 by 0.6. The actual correct coefficient is 0.623, but 0.6 is good enough. That will tell us how much rain we will collect in a one-inch rainstorm in North Texas. So 2,000 square foot home, 1,200 gallons of water. Turn that annually, you're talking 38,000 gallons or more. That's based on 32 inches. How much water do you think we got in 2015? How many times, or how many times last year do you think you needed to water your landscape? I'm going to make y'all start playing ball. Start guessing some of <laughs> out, out of 52 weeks, how many times do you think you had to water? Seven, two, yeah. five, five, three, three one. one. Based on our weather data, zero. 
Yeah. You're only talking 14 weeks. And that's if you needed it. If you had a shaky landscape, you probably didn't need it. All right? And that was based on a planned landscape, not native landscapes. All right? That's a big difference. 52 weeks. How many people do you know that are watering all 52 weeks? You starting to see the problem here? Yeah, during the 10 inches of rain we had last week, I'm sitting there screaming out my window on Saturday morning as I'm watching neighbors' sprinklers go off. And it's pouring down rain. They all know what I do. I'm here, you know, so it's like, well, I posted it all next week. So I, could, I strategically took pictures that didn't have the address in it. So, um, so patching your rainfall. Here's the easy part of rainfall. So you want to know what it is? You've got to get the water in the river. That's it. That's the, that's the difficult part of rainwater harvesting. How you do it, whether you have gutters and downspouts, or if you don't have gutters and downspouts and you have that valley in your roof, you just have to direct the water into the barrel. We are not going to, if you notice from this picture, we're not going to connect downspouts to the barrel. We don't want that because that's opening up for problems, mosquitoes, rodents, things of that nature. We're going to pour the water into the barrel. If the valley of your roof, if none of y'all have gutters, that's okay. Because you probably have that spot in your landscape where all the water hits <laughs> and washes everything out. Guess what? Put the barrel there. That's where you put the barrel. You're going to have more splashing involved than people with gutters and downspouts. But based on that calculation, do you think that 55 gallon barrel is going to fill up pretty quickly? Out of a possible 1,200 gallons? It's going to overflow. We have an overflow when it's sprinkling outside. And I'll show you some videos of that. Can, can you explain this real quick? You know, the, every time I've ever seen one, they obviously didn't come to the spots because they're connecting the gutter to the barrel and kind of almost sealing it. And you mentioned you know, that's where you have mosquito problems. Can you help me understand why that is? So when they're connecting it to the barrel, what's happening is people think you have to, when we say connect your rain barrel, they think they have to hard line connect their barrel to the downspout. What is protecting from a mosquito coming down your downspout into your barrel? Or a squirrel, or a mouse, or a cat. It's happened, it's all happened, right? So that's why we only want you to pour the water in. It's, you want your barrel to be a closed system. All right, that way you don't have any problems. And we'll get into setup and doing all that in just a second. So let's talk about the barrel you're going to do tonight. The barrel we're gonna to do tonight is a process that has evolved, okay? When I came on to AgriLife, I spent 15 years in the industry designing and managing before I came to here. I've now been here five years. And when I came here, I was looking how things we did, and I waited for about a year before I started making my recommendations. And then it took about another week before I said we're changing this. <laughs> because the older way we did things wasn't meant to really last as long. And people were having failure problems and things of that nature. So my colleagues and I got together and really brainstormed. And we came up with some really good parts that we feel are sustainable. And it's something we're all doing in our own home. All right? We walk the walk. We don't just talk the talk. So, all of your barrels today are repurposed food and beverage grade quality barrels. Meaning they had some type of food or beverage in them. Never had a chemical or soap in them. You never want to buy a barrel that had a chemical or soap. I had one person, she went and bought a barrel and I think she said, I don't remember what she said had it. Some type of thinner or something like that. These, this plastic is BPA free. So it hold, it has a residual effect. And when you get one that has soap, you can never rinse the soap out of the barrel, all right? And you don't want to be putting that all over your landscape because although some soaps can help with pests, it can also be harmful to other things in your soil and on your plants. So to make sure it's food and beverage quality. When you go out to get your barrel, when we go from here to that trailer, your barrel's going to be dirty. I'm sorry, we're under construction. It's been raining and it's muddy. Okay, your barrel's going outside if you want it to be nice and clean. I don't know what to tell you, go home and clean it. It's gonna be a little dirty and I apologize for that. It might have some shavings from us drilling it, but the great thing about it is they all have a nice aroma. So the, the running joke is go outside and guess your beverage. <laughs> they all came from a beverage company. We do not release where that beverage company came from because they don't want you knocking on their door for barrels. 
If you want more barrels, I'll tell you how to get them from us. So they're all food and beverage quality, but you do notice that they're white. White my lead what in? Light. Light. So we'll cover that here in just a second as well. We pre-drill all your barrels. We're using spade bits as well as a jigsaw with a PVC blade on it. With a PVC blade, it cuts through that plastic like butter. Works really well. But we pre-drill all of these because I don't know how willing you are with power tools. <laughs> and I don't do well with blood, so it works out great. Now, you also have them received in your hand your three-quarter inch faucet that we have already put the net or uh, Teflon tape on for you. You like how we've done all these steps for you? Yes. Your barrels already have your bulkhead fitting in them. All right? And so this already has the bulkhead, and that is where your faucet will attach. We'll cover that here shortly. Then your mosquito netting, which you also have in your hands. Our front admin ladies were kind enough to cut those for you. I'll explain that. And then the adhesive that we use to attach that mosquito netting, I will have it with us outside, and it's a silicone latex acrylic clear copy. It's going to look hideous going under barrel, but it dries clear, and you won't know it's there after those. So this is how we have assembled our barrels. Some optional things are things like center blocks to elevate your barrel. I'll explain that here shortly. Or bungee cords for those of y'all that want to create an open top barrel, um, and I can explain that to you off on the side. This is how your barrels all arrive to us. We actually have to rent a big Penske truck because that thing does not pull up to a loading dock. Um, load up about 125 barrels per trip. We bring them back to our campus. We unload them. We drill all the barrels with all the components. That is what your $50 is paying for. We are a nonprofit. We're here for the education, not for the profit. All right. So, we start drilling your barrels. We have to create a five to six inch hole at the top of our barrel. And the way we do that is we use things like a one gallon container from a pot. Uh, we've now made ourselves templates, a five to six inch hole. And we create that template. The reason we create that template is we learn that if we don't, it looks more like a jelly bean or something like that, not a circle. So, I drill a pilot hole with the spade bit on the drill so that I can get my jigsaw blade into the barrel. PVC blade cuts through the plastic. Pardon me not wearing gloves and safety equipment, but this was just a photo shoot. <laughs> Somebody pointed that out on the video. Uh, we cut the top of those barrels out and have our five to six inch hole. All the caps that we remove from these barrels are either recycled or repurposed for demonstrations and things of that nature. Because everybody always does. <laughs> now, we're going to also drill a hole at the bottom of the barrel opposite of the five to six inch hole. And we notice when we drill it, we use a hole bit. It is a one and three quarter inch hole bit. And we're about two to three inches off the bottom of the barrel. Why would we give two to three inches? Sediment. Sediment. You're listening. So we create the one three quarter hole at the bottom. Here's the tricky part. Your bulkhead fitting, the back half of it, has to go inside the barrel through the hole so that we can then thread everything onto the bulkhead fitting. Well, thank you for putting it well, in. Well, your barrels are three feet tall. Guess what? My arm is not three feet tall. <laughs> so this is why we started the bulkhead fitting for you, because we knew most people didn't have a yardstick and duct tape at home. <laughs> so we feed the bulkhead fitting through the bottom of the barrel like so, and then we're able to thread the nuts on. Your uh, bulkhead fittings thread opposite. So you know righty tight and lefty loosey? These are righty loosey lefty tight. <laughs> Can you say that 10 times? Yeah. The reason for that is we are now going to start your faucet. If they both thread the same way as you're tightening one, you're loosening the other. Okay? So we put the Teflon, there's your bulkhead fitting. Oh, and your bulkhead fitting, we have purchased and added, you have two rubber gaskets, washers. One is on the inside and one is on the outside of your barrel. We put the Teflon tape on clockwise because we're now going right and tidy. So you want to make sure it's not unthreading while you're tightening it on there. And then we start the, the faucet. Here's the first thing you're going to do when you go outside. When you go outside and you receive your barrel and you get your beverage, you're going to put your barrel on its side. All right, not like the picture. And you're going to hold on to that bulk of fitting. You can tighten it down if you want a little bit, but don't overdo it because as you tighten your faucet, it will tighten the bulkhead fitting at the same time. When you put your faucet down into your bulkhead fitting, to your bulkhead fitting, 
I have to remember the opposite thread. I want you to go in there and I want you to kind of go to the left a little bit. You'll feel it kind of fall down into place. And then I want you to start turning your faucet. If your faucet starts turning sideways, stop. This is plastic. This is brass. Which one do you think will win in a street fight? <laughs> do not strip your bulkhead fitting. These are $16 a piece. Okay? And I didn't bring my yard stick. Alright? So you're gonna you're gonna let it kind of fall in place and then you can turn it and it'll start going in. It may sometimes take a couple of tries. Help your neighbor, because I'm one person tonight, and just make sure it's going in nice and straight and not crooked. The other thing is, as you're turning your faucet, I want you to grab a hold of it here and at the handle. Don't grab a hold of it at the threading where the hose will attach. The reason for that is, if you feel how sharp it is, this is brand new brass, you will cut your hands up. You have been warned liability is off of me. <laughs> All right? Just be very careful. It will cut your hands up. Trust me, I've done it numerous times. Try to turn it from the handle of the side. You're only going to tighten it, oh, you're only going to tighten it hand tight. It's not going to go all the way. You see this distance right here? It's only going to go in maybe a third or halfway. If you have OCD and you need it to be flush, you can take a wrench to it and get home and tighten it all the way down. But it won't. That's what the Teflon tape is for. All right? Just hand tight. You may have to tighten it as it gets water in there. You might see a drip and you have to tighten it a little bit more. That's part of the adjustment period. One step that you can do when you get home. We don't do this part of the class because it takes quite a bit more of the copy. One of the things I have found, and I did on mine, is in between your bulkhead fitting and your barrel, where the rubber washer is, I put a bead of copy all the way around. Because one of the things that I have found is as my barrel fills up, and I use the water, as it heats up and as it cools off, what's happening? The plastic is moving. It happens with every barrel. Okay? What can happen is you might get a drip out of that rubber gasket because it's no longer flush to the barrel. It's not enough to empty your barrel. It was just enough to annoy you. So I put a bead of the caulking around there and just added water seat. Some people have never done it and haven't needed to do it. It's up to you. While you're sitting there right now, everybody pick your faucets up. And turn your faucets in the off position, right and tight. That's the biggest lesson I taught you. Please do not email me and tell me your barrel did not harvest rainwater because I'm going to ask if your faucets in the off position. <laughs> <laughs> happens every year. Alright. Now, the top, the hole at the top of the barrel is that five, six inch hole. We're going to put that beam of the caulking around the top opening of that barrel. Why is that? And the reason we're going to do that is we're now going to put our mosquito netting down. I'm going to be allowing y'all to do the caulking yourself at the top of your barrel. But I want everybody to look at this. This is a bead of caulking. I tell the last time I said, put a generous amount of the caulking. And one person used half the bottle. Okay. Goes a long way, people. So this is a bead of caulking. Right? So I will allow you to do it yourself until somebody puts too much. But if you need a little bit more, add a little bit more. Don't have too much. All right. Once you put that on there, you're going to take that mosquito netting and you're going to place it over the caulking. And then you're going to take your paper towel that I gave you. Pull one corner of that mosquito netting and start spreading all through that mosquito netting. Making sure that all the edges, the corners, are all adhered to the top of the barrel. You don't want any loose pieces or gaps because water, wind, everything can get underneath it and it will wear. If you do it this way and you make sure every edge and corner is down, there's people that have never had to change their mosquito netting. And you notice your mosquito netting is not metal. Why would we not use metal? The rain will eat right through it. Okay? So when you're done, like I told you, it's going to look hideous. But you also notice that I didn't smear the caulking over the opening. <laughs> <laughs> you know there's a reason I have to emphasize it. <laughs> okay, it will dry clear, you won't notice it 
afterwards, be careful. Now, one other added step that you can do when you get home, we simply do not have the time because of the hundreds of barrels that we have to do in between teaching classes. Remember the bird bath lady? Yes. What happened was she didn't create the drainage holes that I talked to her about. Her top of her barrel, you'll notice there's a lip. These weren't designed for rain barrels. They were designed to have stuff in it, not outside of it. That top can hold water. We don't want that because of what? So one of the things that I have done is I've increased my bit to about a quarter an inch. Some pair of people went up to half an inch, drilled it. And I drilled basically what I call downspouts or drainage holes from the top of the barrel to the outside of the barrel, not back into the barrel. That allows the water to drain from the top of the barrel. Some of these may already have some holes in place that the manufacturer did. This just allows the water to drain like off the top of your roof, off of the top of the barrel and out back in the barrel. Does that make sense? If you open up another hole on the top of your barrel, you're going to have to close it and protect it somehow. Anybody have questions about this part? So just one hole? I do five to six. And any drill bit will work through this plastic. It cuts through it very, very easily. Surprisingly, you'll see how durable this plastic is, but it's super soft to drill over. It's really easy. Okay? All right. Now, connecting to your downspout. What do you see wrong with this picture? It's connected. <laughs> it's actually connected to the barrel. That's not what we want you to do. All right? This goes back to what is preventing that mosquito, squirrel, rodent, from going down in the barrel. They're probably not going to be able to get back up, all right? We don't want that. The other thing you're going to do is you're going to elevate your barrel about 12 to 18 inches. And I'm going to explain that to you in just a second. But if you look here, this shows where the downspout was, and this is where they had to cut the downspout to add the barrel. If you have seams, gutters and downspouts, you're going to need to invest in the hacksaw. Because you're going to have to shorten your downspout. Because your downspout is all the way to the ground, right? Yes. Your barrel's three feet tall, you're going to elevate it 12 to 18 inches tall, that downspout goes down to the wall. If you don't have gutters, or seamless gutters and downspouts, there's typically just a little screw holding on that long section. You undo that screw and the whole thing pops off. That's it. That's all it is. And you can buy these little adapters from the hardware store for about eight bucks. They come in all different colors. They're plastic, they're accordion, and they expand out to about five and a half feet. So like that other picture, you can see how you can bring that barrel around the corner, take it out a little bit. Some people like to reuse the same materials that they use, they have on their gutters and downspouts, like you see here. They reuse the elbows on that downspout just to pour the water into that barrel. Same thing right here, you can see 12 to 18 inches, the barrel, and then they redirected their downspout to pour into the bar, or into the barrel. That's a nice system, isn't it? That's actually somebody who came to this class. All right, rain chains are growing in popularity. Rain chains have been around for a long time, all right? That's how they, they created, you know, downspouts, gutters. We got from casters. That's where they gargoyles spit water out, you know, cathedrals and things. Rain chains were very popular. And as you can see from this picture, a rain chain can literally be a chain. A chain. All right, you're just providing a, a avenue for the water to travel. There's a lot of store-bought ones you can purchase. Copper. If you don't have gutters and downspouts, you can see here where they have the little splash guard at the valley of the roof to catch the water and travel down the rain chain. This one is one that I actually did for a friend. We cut the tops of wine bottles off, <coughs> put the chain through it with washers and hold it in place. All the wine bottles were donated for that project. <laughs> and you can see here the rain chains in action. And one of the things I love pointing out in this picture is if you notice, it's just sprinkling outside. It's not pouring down rain out here. This is the water coming off the gutters. Same thing over here. And look how much water is pouring down that rain chain. Do you actually, do you remember being a kid and when you were allowed to play in the rain, you watched the water come out downspouts off the roof and things, how much water would be? Don't forget that. That's how much water is coming off of our roofs. Now, let's talk about some overflow. 
Some, in most instances, not everybody needs overflow from their barrel, meaning the barrels are going to overflow, guaranteed. They will overflow. Some people don't want that water accumulating by their house because they don't have proper slope away from their house or things have settled, right? Or things have settled, right? It just decided to turn off altogether. Oh, I think I might have done that. It was me. I had the power cord. It's yeah. So, but they, you want to redirect the water away from the house. So, on my house, one side of my house is flat. So, I have to put an overflow to redirect water away from my house. Because too much water by my foundation is just as bad as too little water, right? Yes. On the other side of my house, I have a nice slope. I don't put an overflow on because my barrel overflows at what? The top. The top of the mosquito net. And it travels down the side of the barrel away from my house. So I have a nice water feature when it rains outside. Just overflowing out the side of the barrel. So that's what I... Okay. That's how I do my barrels. I don't actually do overflow. I can't believe I kicked the plug out. Now, what do you see the overflow also could be helpful for? Connecting multiple barrels. How many here bought more than one barrel? How many here started to think maybe I need to buy one? <laughs> this is also how you would connect multiple barrels together. When one barrel fills up, it overflows into the next. Does that make sense? You can. So that's another thing is a lot of people feel like they need to have a barrel like on every single downspout. And that's not what we want people to do. You don't need a barrel on every single downspout. You need to choose the barrel that has, or the downspout that has the most water flow into it. So you can see here, there, this hose, is. this isn't really doing much. The water's shooting back, it's flooding. They have an overflow water hose, but it's simply not enough. They put a larger one here to redirect the water away from the walkway. You can see here a drain pipe redirecting the water away. But we can use that overflow to connect multiple barrels. So when one barrel fills up from the downspout, it overflows into the next. And then as this one fills up, it overflows into the next. Do you understand that? I don't see how it's overflowing into it because of the same level. Because see the hose connected at the top? So this one fills up from the rainfall, and it goes travels through the hose into the next barrel. I, I didn't see that. Yeah. What do you see wrong with this picture? Mm -hmm. They're not elevated. They're not elevated. The, Those clouds are in the middle. The clouds are in the middle. Yeah. What about the foot of water underneath here? How many get that? A lot water? of sediment. Right. <laughs> And the other thing is, if I connect all my barrels at the top, each barrel has to have a faucet so I can get the water out. Right. Yeah. The water's not going to travel back up and across, right? right. Yeah. If I connect them all at the bottom, then I only need one exit. Because for the most part, they start filling and lowering together. You see how that benefits? <laughs> some people have done both. I think that's a little extreme. But in some instances, connecting at the bottom, six barrels, one downspout. So over 300 gallons of water off of one downspout. Think you can get a lot of uh, use out of that? These are all connected at the top, but they each have a fossil. I have a question. Huh? If they're connected at the bottom, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I can understand that if, if you have it, it's like a septic system. If you have it at the top, it's not going to overflow. It's just going to fall on the other one. But if it's at the bottom, wouldn't it still push out? Well, it, yes and no. If we have a torrential downpour like we've had this last week, the likelihood of that one little hose keeping up with the velocity of water going into the barrel to overflow into the next, you may get some spillage over that barrel. It's not really enough to you know, have stress or anxiety over, but on an average rainfall, it will keep up with it. That's a good question. Connected at the top, one downspout. Those aren't elevated though, keep that in mind. Now, what I like about this picture is because not that you need to lower one barrel. You do not need to do that at our sea level. 
But their faucets, the way they've connected all their barrels, is they replace the faucets we gave you with the Y faucet. One has two spigots and ran a section of hose between each barrel. As long as that faucet is open, the water will travel and fill those barrels up, right? So that's how you can connect the barrel system that we're doing tonight without having to do any more drilling. It's already done. You just connect them all together like that. Who thinks they can handle that? Easy breezy. 16 barrels, two downspouts. <laughs> This is not what we want control. you to do. <laughs> if you get to this extreme, you need to upgrade to the larger sister class. All right? Medicare. Number one, every connection between those barrels is a point of failure where you can have cracks and breaks and leaks. There's too many points to have a problem. And look how much work they're taking. Why not just have a larger cistern down at the end taking up less room, but holding the same amount of water? How, many, how, many, how big do you think that 1,000-gallon cistern is? I showed you that picture at our house. It's five and a half feet wide by six feet tall. 1,000 gallons makes you think, oh my gosh, it's the size of this room. No, this would actually be closer to a million gallons. Right? It doesn't, it's not as big as you think it is. Now let's talk real quickly about elevating your barrel. Elevating your barrel does what? Allows you to get water. Allows you to get water out of the barrel. Increases water pressure. It increases water pressure a little bit. Is it still, is it enough? Yeah, I'll let you decide that. 12 to 18 inches is all we recommend. Don't take it any further than that. Create a liability for yourself. What do you see wrong with this? <laughs> That's going to fall over on somebody. Yeah. Water weighs how much a gallon? Same pounds. Just over eight pounds a gallon. 55 gallons times eight. You want that falling on you, your grandkid, your kid, your dog, that prized plant, right? No. So don't create a liability. Oh, when they've done those two center blocks, they haven't even gained one PSI. Hmm. That's, they haven't. Do something more secure like this. They even secured them to the wall so that it wouldn't be an issue. This is wood stands. I really like that. That's nice and secure. Give it a good foundation to sit on. I found that one on Pinterest. I'd like to share that one. I thought it was pretty clever. It was pretty easy. And depending on your budget, the time, what you're willing to do. There's two barrels in there. You can match that and disguise it with your fence outside of mine. Now, elevating your barrel. For every linear foot of water, we get 0.433 PSI. So if this room had one foot of water in it, we have 0.433 PSI. Your barrel with one foot of water in it has 0.433 PSI. You following me here? Yes. Your barrel full at ground level has 1.3 PSI. At our sea level, when we elevate it an initial 12 to 18 inches, we can double that to 2.6 PSI. You know how much the PSI that comes out of your faucet at your home? Between 40 and 80. Yeah, not 2.6. So it's not enough pressure to run a lot of things are through a long hose. It's enough to fill a watering can. To run some drip irrigation off of gravity fed. But this is where pumps might come into effect if you want it. A simple barrel most people use, a watering can or something of that nature. Bigger cisterns, we look into other things. So for small cases, you can just use it that way. If you're looking to do drip, we recommend you invest in a drip filter or a Y strainer. It helps filter out more of those particulates that can get in there that won't clog up some of your drip. But not all drip works off of a rain barrel with gravity fed. Your smaller drip tubing, like quarter inch tubing, or we call it spaghetti tubing, will work. Not to manufacture standards, but it will work. I use this on my containers when I go out of town and it works great when I run it through my containers. Soaker hoses, again, it will work, not to manufacture standards. Point source drip, where you put the emitter where you need it, like for vegetable gardening, it will work. You just have to run it a little longer. The one drip it will not work on without the use of a pump system is inline drip. Kind of like the drip that you see in landscape beds around town. Those are designed to have equal pressure throughout all the tubing. We're not going to get that at 2.6 psi. All right? So there's different types of pumps. Submergible pumps I'm not a big fan of unless you have a fountain or something like that, because they, they wear out. You have to replace them, and you have to get it in there. 
and they got to get it out to replace it or work on it. Transfer pumps or external pumps are more reliable. I've had mine for about 10 years and it still works great. They have a little handle on them. You attach them to your faucet. I attach a water hose to it, drinks to me. The thing is, you don't leave this outside of the elements. I bring it in the garage when I'm done with it. I put quick connects on it so I can attach it to the barrels. It's very easy to do. But you have to think through this if you're going to do drip. We talk about this in our drip conversion class. Now, what do you see wrong with this picture? Clear. It's clear tubing. It's clear What's wrong with clear tubing? Like the, the, the greenhouse effect. Glass, room clear, water, algae. I will tell you, some of y'all, if not all of y'all, will get a little bit of algae in your barrel. It's not enough to stress over if you're using the water. If your barrel looks like this, that tells me you're being a rainwater portal <laughs> and you're not using the water. <laughs> Use the water. If you know that it's going to, we're going to have rain, Use it to moisten your soil. Moistened soil absorbs more water than dry soil, and you get fresh water in your barrel. Don't let it get to this extreme. If you're using your water, this is not something to be concerned about. But our barrels are white, somewhat clear. And I will tell you that I, one of my barrels, it's white and clear. It gets a considerable amount of sun. I have a little bit of algae, but it's not enough for me to worry about. Okay, so we have different publications. We're working on revamping these and they'll be available on our website where we tell you step by step how you can cover your barrel with wood to make it look like an old fashioned cistern or how to paint your barrel because there's a certain way to do this. One of the steps that it talks about is sanding the outside of your barrel, spend about five minutes roughing up the surface using a black primer. Based on a research study I did, the only color that kept out sunlight out of the barrel was black. So using a black primer, from there you can then color it and do whatever you want to your barrel. This one right here was a barrel that I did for my mother to match the color of her home. I even painted the bricks, center blocks to match. She wanted to blend in, she didn't want it to stand out. But there's a lot of people that are very creative out there who want their barrels to stand out. This is actually similar to one that I did where they put a drawstring in a shade cloth or a tarp to cover their barrel. Keep all the sunlight out and shade it. But there's some good artists out there. There's some people that have gotten really creative with their barrels, including making them look like old-fashioned whiskey barrels and things of that nature. Some people have used old wine barrels and whiskey barrels. The problem with that is you have to let the water soak in and expand the wood, otherwise it will leak. Some of them just want to just disguise it from the, the curb so people don't see it, out of sight, out of mind. But they don't really want to do anything more than that. You can see these are fences that are covering this one, and they just put a green wall to climb up right there. But there are some wonderful artists out there, and some of y'all may be some of those artists. Don't be afraid to make it a focal point in the garden. Use it to do art with your grandkids, your kids, things of that nature. We've even done art contests like at the Dallas Art Arena. That great in your barrel, they auctioned them off for a good cause after that. This gentleman right here did his barrel. He was part of a brain barrel class I did for a Bell Helicopter. His last name is Barber. <laughs> this guy went really far with the wood. This guy, once he primed his barrel, he realized that the color black behind the shrubs, it got lost. So he said, I just left it black. That's okay. You can do that. A lot of people have done the wood. They like that cold look, that sister look. What kind of paint is it? Is it acrylic paint? It has to make sure it says for plastic. Plastic. Uh, and then, oh, okay. <laughs> what if your house is here and you have a little bit out like this and it breaks or breaks down like that? What's the foundation? Do you have your recommendation on how to Yeah, it's all about the base. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to create a level base for those center blocks. So I put two center blocks, put one here and one there. And then, well, see one. One down, dig it out. You're gonna have to dig it out a little bit. Right. To create a little place. Right. Um, this gentleman is actually, he went to a rap company that wraps cars. <laughs> R2D2. This was a teacher. I thought the minion was pretty cool. This is a gentleman that just came to one of our barrel classes, sent me this picture. This one was Southwest employees. They had a decorating contest. And one lady's 11 year old daughter. <laughs> 
So no more excuses you can do, right? Now let's talk a little bit about maintenance. You're going to have to brush off your barrel from time to time. You're going to get leaves, debris, things of that nature on the top. Replace the insect netting that ever breaks. Some people have said during the hailstorm, it went right through it. Another person, a limb broke off their tree, went through it. One gentleman, his horses got thirsty and went through it. <laughs> if you do get algae and you're concerned about it, you can use a little bit of vinegar or a little bit of bleach, but I would recommend doing that. Use the water and algae won't be a concern. Larvicide. Some people are concerned about mosquitoes no matter what. And there's a brand out there, there's lots of brands now for larvicide and mosquito control. If you're a butterfly gardener, you need to use this with caution because a larvicide prevents any larva from maturing into an adult. So if you're spraying your butterfly larva, they will never mature. They will always be a larva, okay? So be use this with caution. Our rule of thumb is don't let the mosquitoes in and don't let them out. So mosquito eggs are microscopic. If we have a rain event and you have water sitting in your gutters and a mosquito lays eggs in that water and then immediately following a rain event, where do you think those eggs are going? Into your barrel. Some people have panicked and said, I have mosquitoes in my barrel, but don't let them out. Because if they can't come out and reproduce and feed, what are they going to do? They're going to die. Okay, so don't get stressed out over it. How long do you have to leave them there? They'll die eventually. They'll take days, but they'll die. So you don't let you don't use your water at all. Well, if it's just raining. No, I use it. They're not going to be coming out of the water. They're just going to be buzzing around in there if they can't get out. Okay. If you're starving, then that's basically what you're doing. Okay. Um, use the water. Don't collect if the oaks are blooming. Those yellow catkins I talked about. Keep your gutters cleaned out. If it's going to freeze, let out a couple of inches out of your barrel because freezing water does what? Where do you think it's going to expand out? Of mosquito netting. We very rarely have had mosquitoes freeze soft. All right. Uh, in fact, this was one of the first years we've had people say my barrels froze solid because we had some areas wind chill of like six and seven. We can't help that. All right. Larger cisterns, it's not an issue. How many of y'all live in an HOA? Yeah, there's always a few. I go to Frisco everywhere. Raises their hand. They are 98% HOA. You move to Frisco, you're living in an HOA. Uh, I'd like to tell you about this because Texas Senate Bill 198 went into effect on September of 2013. And what it does is the state said to HOAs, you need to allow your residents to do water efficient practices. Things like composting. If you want to compost on your property, you can do so. But they can tell you it has to be in the backyard. Things like rainwater harvesting. They cannot tell you you cannot do it. If they want to enforce location and aesthetics, they can do so. But they cannot require you to obtain permission to do so. If it's how many gallons or less? 500 or less. Efficient irrigation like drip irrigation. If you want to do that, you can do it. Native adaptive landscaping. If you want to switch out your landscape, they can no longer provide a plant list for you to follow. They can require you to submit a landscape design. They cannot require you to hire a professional. It can be on the back of our publication done by you. It does say they have to approve it within reason, meaning they can tell you you have too much rock or your vegetable garden has to be in the backyard. Fair enough. They cannot tell you you can only have one type of grass anymore. If you want to have a different type of grass, you can do so. They can only enforce you have to maintain like 25% turf in your front yard and the maintenance of that turf. That's the most they can do. I am not here for legal counsel. If you want to know more, Google it, talk to your senator, talk to your property management company. I'm just making you a better educated consumer. Now, there is in the back, I have some tax exempt forms if you're interested in taking it. For those of y'all who have said, well, now I need others. Or I want to buy a cistern, or I want to buy some adapters to do rainwater harvesting. Well, the state of Texas has made everything that you do for rainwater harvesting tax exempt. The only thing it doesn't include is labor. So if you want gutters, your materials will be tax exempt if you're doing it for the sole purpose of harvesting rainwater. At the bottom of the form, it does say the certificate does not require a number. Why does the state of Texas need their own tax exempt number, right? Well, some people have had problems when they go into the big box stores, um, getting taking this, uh, getting this discount or the tax exemption. Um, they're trying to put a number in, and it's a code they have to put in. So my best advice to you is go to customer service first. Tell them what you're doing and why you're doing it. And hand them the form. Let them figure out what they need to do before you fill up your buggy and hold up the line because one of us might be standing behind you. Um, if you need additional barrels. Uh, you can purchase, now that you've taken the class, your name is always on file with us, you can purchase additional barrels. 
$50 forever for everything with its components. If you want a plain Jane barrel undrilled or anything done to it for additional storage or do your own thing, only $25. You do have to pick them up from us or come where we're having a rain barrel class and communicate with us that you want a barrel. Uh, as of right now, it's very difficult for you to pick them up at our campus, but we can work it out. We can do the best that we can. Please don't be this neighbor. <laughs> you're going to get the bug. You're going to get the addiction. And we're excited for that, right? It's okay to be this person. Just don't be this person. If it gets to be this extreme, there's better, more steady, nicer ways you can harvest rainwater. How many gallons of water do you think that is? 3,000. That's 5,000 gallons. Not as big as you would think it is. Doesn't matter what vehicle you have, we can get it home tonight. I'm proud of every single one of these pictures. <laughs> him down and say, I've got to take a picture. <laughs> and that is a smart car. They look bigger than they, they're more intimidating than the size. They're only three feet tall, 24 inches wide. If you put down the front passenger seat and lay all the way back, it will fit in the passenger seat and lay across the back seat. Be very careful when you're loading up your barrels. That adhesive, the, the silicone copy will not be dry. It takes two hours, minimum. It's cooler outside, it may take a little longer. If you get this on leather, on fabric, it's not for now. I have shirts that still have it on it after being laundered numerous times. And if your barrel still has a little bit of that wonderful smelling syrup in it, you might want to dump it out on the grass before you put it in your vehicle when you get all over your seats. I cannot help you load your barrels because of this very reason. If you get it on the inside of your vehicle or anything goes wrong on the inside of your vehicle, it's on you and not me. So if you need help, ask a neighbor or somebody if you can't lift the barrel up. We are EPA WaterSense Partners of the Year, uh, multiple times now. We have the first WaterSense labeled home in North Texas on our campus uh, that you can come and tour right now.